Okay, welcome everybody. Um, uh, I'm glad that you were able to make it here. I know that's not an easy place to find for some people, so thank you for making the effort. I'm Ron Jenkins. I'm the uh, teacher of the class uh, of which this performance is a culmination. Uh, and what we, at the beginning, I'd like to thank very much the Institute of Sacred Music for hosting this class, hosting this performance, especially Martin Jean, the director, who's here. Uh, welcome. And uh, the, all the staff, Kristen Foreman, Andrea Hart, Jacqueline uh, Campoli, um, Melissa Mayer, uh, everybody, uh, Sasha and, uh, and Albert, all, so many people work to make it possible for the students here uh, Yale undergraduates, Yale Divinity School students, uh, Yale students from the Institute of Sacred Music to go every week to the prison uh, where uh, also we have to thank uh, Ms. Perot and uh, Dan Lewis who I don't know if, his, if he's here um, but uh, people at the, at the uh, McDougall Walker prison were extraordinarily helpful in making it possible for us to, uh, to create the program there, teach the course there and I uh, want to thank the, uh, the families of the men that we worked with there, some of whom are here today. I want to invite you all, the performance is about an hour, uh, and then after that, we invite you all to stay for a discussion um, uh, with, the, with the actors to talk about the experience of creating this piece in the prison and to uh, talk with uh, Ms. Perot, one of the teacher, the direct, the principal of the school at the prison. Um, and, um, the, uh, another guest artist who worked in the past with me in other prisons. Um, so uh, please stay and join us for that conversation. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar. Uh, welcome, Andrea, we just thanked you. You missed your thank you. Um, and uh, but this, the, the basic, uh, Dante's poem, The Divine Comedy, on which this piece is based, is a complicated poem, but the story, in a way, is very simple. It's just the story of a journey of a man's journey from hell through purgatory to heaven, a journey from a, a, a pretty awful place to a place that's more desirable. And that's the journey that many of us are on in our lives, uh, and uh, it's a journey certainly that has a lot of resonance for men and women in prison um, who are you know, hoping to move from a place that's not so great to a better place in their lives. So that was the starting point of our work. Uh, we brought in the poem and we uh, read it together and what you'll see today are the, uh, the, the results of the writings that the men at the McDougall Walker prison wrote in response to Dante's journey. So you'll see writings not of the, of, the, of the Yale students but the writings of the men in prison interwoven with the writings of Dante and with different songs that they chose uh, to inspire them. The way Dante on his journey has poetry and music to help inspire him to go further. Uh, the men had, had, had uh, music and songs that they chose. And they also chose their own guides. Dante has, welcome, come on in. There's seats in the front row, so you're, you're, you, can, uh, you can, can sit up front. So da uh, Dante had his guide. Yes, come right on up here. Okay, thank you. Dante's guide was Virgil, the poet Virgil, and the, uh, um, uh, the men and, in prison chose their own guides, you know, uh, their own guides from, from anyone in history, you know, so some guides, some chose Moses as their guide, some chose Derek Jeter as their guides. It could be anybody that they, uh, they admired and would kind of inspire them to take this difficult journey. So you'll see all that here and, uh, you understand that the words are the words of the men in prison. Sometimes, um, uh, sometimes when you hear the words of Dante, the actors will be raising up the book. This is the book that they use as their text. Dante is the inferno part of the Divine Comedy. So when you see the book up in the air, you'll know the words that you're hearing are Dante's words. Other than that, it will be the words that were written by the men in prison, except for the, for the song. Um, uh, and most people, for most popular people, the popular idea of Dante's Inferno, everybody's heard of it, but not everybody's read it. And you might think, oh, it's about suffering and pain and torture. You know, why would you want to make a play about suffering, pain, and torture and make people read it when they're in prison? But the, uh, uh, it's, it's really a, a play, as I said, about this journey. It's about hope. It's, about, it's a, a poem 
where hope is, re is, uh, is, is important. And in one of his uh, wonderful books about Dante, one of the professors here at the uh, Institute of Sacred Music, Peter Hawkins, uh, quoted, uh, quoted St. Paul. Yeah, the, an important quote from St. Paul in his book about Dante, he said, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And he quoted St. Paul's words in the part of the book where he talks about how Dante is not really focusing on the suffering. He's focusing on how art and music and language and all forms of beauty help people in the journey of self-transformation. Dante's journey is a journey of self-transformation. Um, and Peter Hawkins wrote about it in his book, um, and he's a great Dante scholar, but the men in the prison understood it instinctively. They understood that this was about self-transformation. They knew they themselves uh, are in a period where self-transformation is really important, and they could identify with Dante as someone who was convicted of crimes in his lifetime. He was in exile. When he was writing the poem, he was under the punishment of, uh, of, of death. If he returned to his home, he would have been executed. So he was convicted of crimes, he was exiled, so he couldn't see his family and his, uh, uh, his home uh, for many years. So uh, men in prison, unfortunately, can identify with that situation. They could identify with Dante, and, they, and as they were reading the poem, they weren't identifying with the people who were stuck, the sinners who were stuck in hell. They were identifying with Dante himself, who wasn't stuck, who was going to get out of hell, who was you know, determined to move out of hell through purgatory into heaven and to learn something about himself in the process and transform himself. Uh, and that's the character that, that uh, the men in McDougall Walker uh, were identifying with, and it's the one that uh, inspired them to write the pieces that you're going to hear today. Uh, so this is a very informal presentation. We, uh, you know, we, we uh, unfortunately didn't have as many sessions as we wanted in the prison because there were so many snowstorms this year. Uh, and we couldn't always get there. And we didn't have many rehearsals here. So it'll be very informal. Not, uh, and it will be, um, uh, and you'll see uh, the, how the students in their interactions uh, you'll see scenes where, Dan where Dante starts out his journey in hell. The, he, you, the famous words on the gates of hell are quoted, abandon all hope, you who enter here. But they wrote their own words, what they would put on the gates of hell, what they would put on the gates of heaven, and what they would put on the gates of their soul. So you'll hear some of that. And when Dante is stopped by these obstacles, the lion and the leopard and the, uh, and the, uh, and the wolf, who stop him, who represent you know, violence and, uh, and vanity and greed, uh, stop him on his journey. The men invented their own obstacles that stopped them for other reasons, because we're all stopped by some kinds of obstacles on, on, on our journey. So that's, uh, they're the sections of the poem that you'll encounter most, most frequently. Um, the, the, um, the only song that you'll hear that is not uh, written by this group of men is the very first song. All the other songs were uh, songs that were chosen by the men. None of them were written by the men, except the first song was written by a man that we worked with in another prison several years ago. It's a song in Spanish, and it's a uh, song about uh, how difficult it is uh, to be in prison when nobody can really understand the situation that you're in. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and it's uh, called Nadie Mi Comprende. Uh, and we'll begin the show with that. Thank you. Nadie comprende mi situación. Por eso vengo ante ti, Señor. Hay alegría en mi corazón. Y echaron raíces lástimas en mi interior. Son marcas, Señor, que llevo en mí. Trato de arrancarlas, olvidarlas, pero ellas siguen. Yo vivo en paz. 
Si tú vives en mí, yo tengo amor. Si tú vives en mí y nada me falta, Jesús, tú eres mi todo. Gracias, Señor, porque tú me comprendes, amigo y hermano. Sé que has pasado por la misma situación que describe esta canción. Te sientes solo, triste, traicionado. Más por fuera estás riendo, más por dentro estás llorando. Yo vivo en paz. Si tú vives en mí, yo tengo amor. Si tú vives en mí, nada me falta, Jesús. Tú eres mi todo. Gracias, Señor, porque tú me comprendes. Jesse Paredes, who goes by Jay, was initially a little intimidated by Dante's text, but he quickly began to feel that the medieval Italian poet was writing directly to his condition. Jay, who cuts an intimidating figure himself and who I will hasten to say is a much nimbler writer than I am an actor, uh, told us during our first meeting, Dante weeps more than any man I've ever met. He was impressed by this. Dante is able to go on, Jay told us, because he always stays human. Staying human behind bars means reflecting on everything that had led to his incarceration and doing his bid, but without becoming the environment that he was in, without losing his identity, his dreams, and his community. As Jay told us, prison is not physical, it's emotional and mental. In the fifth year of his bid, at McDougall Walker, Jay is currently a volunteer facilitator in the Alternative to Violence project. He wants to continue writing his Dante adaptation, to continue his exploration of self, but most of all, he wants to go home, to be with his family, to enjoy life, the feeling of the sun on his face, the grass under his feet, and, like Dante, to look up at the stars. The three beasts you're about to meet show up in the opening of Dante's Inferno as well, where we also find the famous inscription on the gates of hell Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. We begin with Jay's version. Welcome to hell. Inferno, Hades, or the underworld. Parallel only to heaven, know that whoever comes in here never goes out. Mortal or immortal does not matter. Hell holds no prejudices, and has no favorites. Enter at your own risk. Disclaimer. All who enter may be, and not excluded to, eternal damnation, extreme pain, suffering, burning, roasting, and skewering. Thoughts of suicide may be prevalent, but as you are already dead or cannot die, this will only make your experience that much more excruciating. Hell cannot be held responsible for any damage to your soul, since it's our job. <laughs> Take a look at my life and see what I've seen. Take a look at my life and see what I've seen. Take a look at my life and see what I've seen. Take a look at my life and see what I've seen. In the middle of the journey of our life, I awoke in a dark wood for the straight way was lost. Not knowing right from wrong, should not from should, I stumbled across a path where a great leopard stood. Not this way, not today, he says, impeding my pace. Look at you, you finally made it, he says with a grin. I thought you were the man, thought you could conquer it all. 
All I see is a punk, a sucker. Your world kicked in, a man who, because of his pride, left his wife and his sons to the wolves. Brother, that's cold-blooded. What's wrong? Can't talk? I thought you had all the answers. Come on, man, it's not just your family, your freedom, your career you lost. What kind of life will you have with the conclusions you brought? Man, you're a waste. Hey, Leo, take a look at this fool. And this Leo took up my case. Didn't take long to understand his name. Six foot six, hair like a lion's mane. Hey, little man, I thought they called you Big J. The only big I see is the damage you made. Damage, I say? What's he talking about? Does everyone here know my ins and outs? Don't bother with speculation. Your story's out in great circulation. Where do I start? From the beginning, you never could live up to your father's upbringing. First to go to college, first to go to prison. And it's the second that's really the way that you're living. You used to be a father. Two great sons you had. Now they're in the hands of another man. Don't think I forgot that woman you love. She gave her heart to you. But don't fret. Women like her bounce back. It just won't be with you, and that's a fact. And a she-wolf that seemed laden with all cravings in her leanness and has caused many peoples to live in wretchedness. Now this guy was scary. Believe me when I tell you. He reeked of death, the survivor of some great hell. As he approached, I could not meet him eye to eye. Could only look down as he circled me like some buzzard in the sky. Finally, he positions himself behind me, hunched back, eyes lowered, arms to his sides, hands like claws that his member and deprive. I feel his head rising, my anxiety rises. Is he here to punish me as well or forsake me as the other two have? At last he rose fully and looked me in the face, yellow eyes and canine teeth that seemed out of place. My whole body shuddered, sweating out a profuse pace. I felt like an orphan, abandoned, defenseless to my fate. I keep the wolf at the door, but he's calling me up. Calls me on the phone, tells me all the ways he's gonna mess me up. Now he spoke with an eloquent tone and said, Hi, my name's Myron. Why so glum? Now this initially shocked me. I'm not sure why. I expected to hear a grunt, a hiss, some demonic voice telling me of my demise. Myron says, Hey, Jay, there's no need to be afraid. I'm here to help you so you can be on your way. What do I do, I ask myself. Do I trust this guy who looks like hell but seems pretty nice? And I know no one else. Steal he says, all my children if I don't pay the ransom. But I'll never see him again if I squeal to the cops. Look, Jay, I understand your apprehension. Just like Alice lost and confused in another dimension. But forget the friends and the family you had. Together we can conquer and leave all in the dust. Make pain and suffering our blood and our guts. Embrace the anger and frustration you feel. Let it empower you. Make it real. No more sobbing and whimpering because of your fear. Let us shed tears of blood. Trample all who come near. <laughs> yes, yes, what is this energy I feel? Suddenly I'm a giant Goliath on the field. I no longer cared, remembered, gave a damn. I am pain, I am suffering, I am misery. I keep the wolf at the door, but he's calling me up. Calls me on the phone, tells me all the ways he's gonna mess me up. Steal all my children if I don't pay the ransom, but I'll never see them again if I squeal to the cops. Carl Lewis is from Westland and Garden in the North End of Hartford. He respects honesty and real. Shikari is conflicted between the life he left behind and the good life that is to come for he and his twins when he's released. Of Dante, Shikari said, This infernal thing that parallels my life. I'm stuck in hell at this point, trying to get to heaven. Shikari chose Rapha Meekmeal as someone whose words he can relate to in hell of his prison. He chose his sister, Rachel Lewis, 
as his true loyal source of inspiration in his search for a high place. It's been a privilege getting to know Jakari over the course of this semester. When I first met him, uh, he seemed a little more withdrawn, but during the course, I've seen him come to embrace the performative side of what we're doing in bringing his words to life. And so he would give us direction and told us, put some fire in it when we're reading his inscription over the gates of hell. In this following piece, you'll see Jakari's inscription over the gates of hell, of heaven, and of his own soul, interspersed with his story of encountering an obstacle on his road to heaven, a cobra, and how he's helped by his Virgil, the rapper Meek Mill. If you escape these dark places and go back to see the beautiful stars, when it will be pleasant to say, I was, see that you speak of us to people. There ain't no grave can hold, can hold my body down. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. As Dante arrives at the gates of hell, he finds a sign with an inscription that reads, Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Justice inspired God to make this place. It was built with three objectives. Detach you from your family, cut off your originality, and kill your independence. Where the sky over the yard is faded, and the walls and the halls are bleach. Welcome to hell. Dream chaser, keep chasing. Grind gonna turn into your shine, be patient. Yeah, a hundred miles running, trying to catch up with my dream, so you know I'm Forrest Gump, and I'm a dream chaser, dream chaser, Dream chaser, it all started from the basement. Me, my pen and my pad, started thinking about things I never had. Was broke as a joke, ain't never laugh. I woke up and went and got it, now they forever mad. How you hate me where I come from, when just a year ago I was the same one. Them dudes you call your homies be the main one. You'd be surprised what people do soon as the fame come. But I ain't worried, discouraged, I just observe it. When my dreams started to crumble, people desert it. Empty courtroom, my judge read my verdict, but now I'm getting to it, people act like they deserve it. Sitting in my cell, watching my dream. Fade like Mike, fourth quarter, tie game. Shackles on my ankles and wrists, my first chain. Now it's hard work on the menu, I thirst cream. I'm a dream chaser, dream chaser, dream chaser. I shouted to Virgil over the din. What's happening? Why are all these people suffering down here? These are the souls of people who never actually did anything evil. They never took sides on moral issues when they have had a ghost. Move. Keep moving. You need to keep moving if you actually want to get where you need to be on this journey. Are you not looking at the same path I'm looking at? Of course I'm looking. You're traveling the same path as you are right now. That's not just any snake. That's a cobra. OK, a snake's a snake. They all slither, lay on their stomach, and they're bad for business. That's where you're wrong. There are different levels of intellect and deadliness within the same family. Cobra's a little bit different. Take a few steps closer. Isn't there a better path we can take with no obstacles? There may be, but who's buying that book? I take four steps towards the cobra. As I step, the cobra rises. We lock eyes. It begins to sway in a seductive manner. I continue to step. Four turns into five, turns into six, quickly turns into seven, eight, nine, ten, and then. You were five seconds away from fangs in your neck. See, the thing about cobras is they're extremely seductive, yet at the same time, extremely deadly. If you're not one of the people who knows how to tame them, you can end up a victim. Some people use them to kill off masses. I'm here. I've conquered and tamed many cobras, and I'm going to show you how to do the same. I think the cobra embodies the environment I was placed into the ghetto, the hood, the inner city, if you will. It's an obstacle for me because I know exactly how deadly it can be, and yet I'm in love with it, still attracted to its seduction. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. The sign over my heaven reads, be aware that upon entering here, mere wishing and hoping is abolished. God made this place. It was built with three objectives, to obtain financial freedom, emotional freedom, and complete interdependence with the co-inhabitants of your soul. Section 8, EBT, and welfare do not exist here. Slavery is not modernized. Love is pure. Struggle exists. And there is pain only in death. Fame is determined by the contributions you make in real life. The grass is green, the water's clean. 
Children smile more than they cry, win more than they lose. Cheating, faking, and lying are the only deadly diseases. After walking through these gates, the roads are smooth and paved. The swings in the park are as rustless and as stainless as the guns they used to give us. This is a place where all fathers are daddies. Heaven. The glory of he who moves all things, penetrates the universe, and shines in some places more, in others less. A guide that I have chosen is my younger sister. She is someone, maybe the only person, I trust wholeheartedly. And that is most important when finding someone to lead you in the right direction. To enter here, one must also have a key to the heart, for the two are closely intertwined. Love inspired God to make this place. It was made with three objectives. To, to give a guide to find a purpose for living, to bring peace to the heart when the depths are rattled, and to inspire the world. To walk through these gates, there must be a bond secured through loyalty, must be someone he can confide in in every season. Restoration will be needed from time to time, but one will never enter a place more sacred, the soul. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. When I hear that trumpet sound, gonna rise right out of the ground. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. Meet me, Jesus, meet me. Meet me in the middle of the air. And if these winds don't fail me, I'll meet you anywhere. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. Ain't no grave. When we first met Lenny, he was smiling, laughing, and at the same time, direct and sincere. Lenny, who since we began to get to know him, has moved on in his journey toward freedom to a lower security prison, shows his resilience and his kindness in the way he takes delight in the true beauty in the small things. In this scene, his daughter, whom he affectionately calls Princess Gigi, sings a version of the Irish folk tune Danny Boy, now called Daddy Mine, which conveys a meaningful sentiment in Lenny's adaptation of Dante, because it is sung to him first by his guide, Dennis, when he's struggling with his beasts. We have written a lot about personal and social hells in this class through exploring Dante's Inferno, and Lenny consistently had profound insights into his own struggles. Yet some of the most profound things he has had to say have been in looking ahead to things that are heavenly based on Dante's vision of heaven in Paradiso. About heaven, Lenny says, heaven is where I'm living up to my true potential. Heaven is where my loved ones are proud of my name and my accomplishments. My kids taking a break from bickering to hug, seeing a shark at the aquarium for the first time. My sister graduating from nursing school, skydiving for the first time, and my aunt achieving all her goals are all symbolic for dreams becoming reality. To me, these are all glimpses of heaven. The scene we will now perform for you describes Lenny entering a clearing between the struggles of hell and the beauty of Lenny's heaven with his guide, Dennis, who was sent by Lenny's daughter to guide him through hell to the time that their family could be reunited. Now the grief-stricken notes begin to make themselves heard by my daughter. Princess Gigi. Oh, daddy mine, the pipes, the pipes are calling. From town to town, beyond the great divide. Oh, daddy mine, there's so much 
much space between us. It's you, it's you, must go and I must buy. But come ye back when many nights have faded and when I've grown up more than you could know. For I'll be here and though I might be jaded, oh daddy mine, oh daddy mine, I miss you so. I awoke from the Sandman's grasp in a dark wood at the edge of a lightless cave. Outside the cave, there was an infenced area containing souls shrouded in light. A beautiful soul ascended, and the souls touched by light began to cheer. I could hear love. I could hear joy, happiness, and hope. As the cheers ebbed, the souls touched by light formed a circle. They held hands, and they began a slow, angelic rendition of Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Brother, we sometimes must descend to ascend. I have brought you here today to show you the follies of not admitting your truths. The liar fears the void, and you have yet to face your truths, for the light has yet to be gained within you. But brother, it has been quite some time since I've shepherded one with such potential. What light? What truths? The only light I see is here behind this fence. If you're so worried about me finding my light, why don't you give me some of yours? Brother, the light that we speak of is a manifestation of our communion with the source. If the source were, say, an infinite ocean of love, infinite possibility, and I took a cup and filled it with some of that infinite ocean, the cup would be your body, and the water inside would be the essence of the source within you. Oh, you mean like pie? I'm sorry, what? Well, you said, the source, which is infinite, can exist within a cup or a body which has finite parameters. An infinite transcendental number exists within a finite circle, pi, the ratio of a circumference of a circle, to its diameter. I am only a failure when I fail to keep trying. Yes, brother. Welcome. As I stood in confusement of what just happened, the souls, touched by light, each put their right hand over their heart, and in unison they all said, Welcome. Welcome. But come ye back when many nights have faded and when I've grown up more than you could know. For I'll be here and though I might be jaded, oh daddy mine. Daddy? Daddy! Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her singing on the roof. Her beauty and the moonlight overthrew you. She spoke to you from heaven's lair. She sang your name, and without despair, from your lips she drew her hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. This man, who from the nethermost pit of the universe to here has seen one by one the lives of the spirits, now begs of thee by thy grace for such power that with his eyes he may rise still higher towards the last salvation.
Raised in the Bronx with two brothers, Noel, 28-year-old Dominicano, has had time to rethink the events of his life that led him to where he is today. He's proud that at this point, he can say that addiction and violence are history, love and faith are present, and positive growth will continue for a better future. The piece that Noel has elected to share with you describes the three beasts that have been obstacles in his personal journey to paradise. They include addiction, bad relationships with women, and the peer pressures of street life. Today in the scene, after Noel encounters these beasts, he's shot at a club. As medics fight to save his life, he falls into a coma and has a vivid dream in which he encounters Derek Jeter, who will serve as his guide through hell. In the middle of the journey of our lives, I came to myself in a dark wood, for the straight way was lost. My life was going pretty well, or so I thought. I had a third shift job, driving my O2 Avalon. It was summertime. Had some bachata on the radio. It was hot outside, but the AC felt good. Suddenly, I saw something up ahead of me in the street. So I pressed my brakes. There he was, black and white tux, floating in the middle of the air. That vampire, he glided over to the passenger door, leaned in through the window, and took a bite. After that, he turned into an eight ball of cane and a bottle of whiskey, and he settled in my hands. A giant rat came and got in my car. <laughs> he was fresh, rocking expensive clothes, some nice jewelry. You look like trouble. Nah, I'm a cool rat. I don't know what you heard about me, but you can't get a dollar out of me. No Cadillac, no perms, you can't see that I'm a mother-loving P.I.M.P. Hey, I'm Sam. Let's go have some fun, my boy. This girl Gianna, down at the club, House of Pleasures, she wants to meet you. Word? All right, let's go. So we switched places, and we drove off. <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm all dressed up. In this club, House of Pleasure, loud music pumping. I can hardly say how I came to this place. So full of sleep was I when I came to it. That's when Sam the Rat introduced me to Gianna. Gianna, this is my boy Platno. Platno, Gianna. Hola, papi. Que lo que, mami? This girl was beautiful. As she started dancing a little closer to me, I danced a little closer to her. She had this great fruity smell. I was all into her, ready to dance when suddenly she turned into a witch, dug her nails into my chest and ripped out my heart. Ha ha, I'm the only witch you'll ever love. Everywhere you go, I'm there. You'll never love again your money. Your house and that stupid car are all mine! Wahaha! -ha. Then she jumped on her broom and flew away. Ah, stupid witch, she tricked me! Suddenly, I heard multiple gunshots. Ha! 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 Ah, I'm hit! I stumbled outside. The rat was gone and the witch took my car, so I was stumbling through the side streets. Before I slipped, I hit my head, and I blacked out. When I came to, there were medics all around me, fighting to save my life, blood everywhere. And then I lost consciousness. Why am I wearing all black? Am I at a funeral? I was outside somewhere. It was nighttime. 
There was fresh, clean cut grass. I saw a guy in the distance. I didn't recognize him, but I still said, excuse me, sir, can you help me, whoever you are? Whoever I am? Hey, turn the lights on. Snap out of it. The only way out of the hell that you're living in is to go right through it. Thus, for your good, I think and judge that you shall follow me, and I shall be your guide, and I will lead you from here to the eternal place, and you will hear the desperate shrieks. There are nine innings in a ball game, also nine levels of hell. I'll guide you through a different type of game, a game full of pain and suffering. You gotta be smart and strong. The only, when you get to the other side, you'll be a champion. You'll make your way to a better life with peace, love, and family. Yes, sir, Mr. Jeter. Please help me get the F out of this place. <laughs> and then an underground tunnel opened up in the middle of the field. This way, kid. And he turned, and I followed. Yvonne is a 22-year-old from Guerrero, Mexico. We've been working on an adaptation of the Inferno that takes him from the streets of Stamford, Connecticut to prison. He says this project has made him face parts of himself that he didn't know existed, both dark and beautiful. The song that you will hear repeated throughout in Spanish is called Bendición Mami. Loosely translated, it means Blessings, Mommy. I'm leaving for the street. Say a prayer for me that my luck won't fail me. If I don't return, it's because I've left for a long trip. And we'll meet in a world where anger doesn't exist. It was curiosity about the United States that made me decide to leave everything I knew to meet my mom for the first time when I was 14 years old. I said goodbye to everybody I loved. And I was already on the road when I thought to myself, maybe this isn't such a good idea. And I had a bad feeling, like maybe I would never go back. But by that time, it was too late. I was already on US soil. So I had to stay. I saw a woman. She looked really similar to a photo that was in my house when I was growing up. And when I saw her, I hugged her, and she said, hello, my son, how are you? I'm good, miss, how are you? And she said with tears in her eyes, why do you call me miss, I'm your mother? And I said, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna say something I don't feel. One afternoon, I was in the kitchen eating some chicken soup. My mom came home from work, and she was really angry about something, and she started yelling at me. And she said, you're just like your father. You're full of pride, and you're selfish. I hate you. And I was like, whoa, what are you talking about? You know what? I don't give a damn. You are not my mom, and I am not your son. Damn the day that I came to this country to be with you. And I left, mad, almost crying, kicking the door on the way out. And my mom, she's still yelling at me. She's saying, where do you think you're going? You don't know where you are. You don't even speak any English. You'll be back. I'm not worried. I know. Listen to your heart when he's calling for you. Listen to your heart. There's nothing else you can do. I don't know where you're going, and I don't know why. Listen to your heart. 
before you tell him goodbye. I saw a sign on the side of the road. It said, this way to the place of pain, hate, and suffering. Fear and sadness live here, where there are a lot of people together, but alone at the same time. I knew this place wasn't, you know, exactly where I wanted to be, but I was looking at the road, and it was covered in money and gold. And so I just started scooping up everything that I could. I knew something wasn't right about this, but I was so excited about what I had in my hands that I didn't stop to ask why. Bendición, mami, me voy para la calle. Reza por mí para que mi suerte no me falle. Y si no regreso es porque me fui de largo viaje. Nos veremos en un mundo donde existe el coraje. I saw that there was something like a party down the road. I heard music, I saw lights, there were voices of women. I had so much money, I could do whatever I wanted. So I started heading there. On the side of the road, I, I saw some cemeteries, a snake, and I started to feel a little bit intimidated, but then I heard a voice. It said to me, why are you letting the fear get the best of you? You've never done that before. How old were you when you got in your first fight? What, nine years old? And everybody respected you after that. How many fights have you been in since then? You lost count, didn't you? Tell me how it feels to have power over somebody else. That adrenaline in your blood, don't you love it? You're the man. Before you were nobody, but now you're a somebody. Go spend all that money. Go crazy. Show everybody ain't nobody else like you. Bendición, mami. Me voy para la calle. Reza por mí para que mi suerte no me falle. My ego shot up, and I started rushing toward that party. When I got her outside the door, I could see some strange, kind of scary things inside. But my ego didn't let the fear get to me. And as I got closer, something reached out and grabbed me and pulled me inside. I started looking around, and there were faces of people that had all sorts of terrible emotions, like fear and anger and sadness. And the worst part of it was, I could tell they would never be able to get out. Listen to your heart. When he's calling for you, listen to your heart. There's nothing else you can do. At that point, I lost my hope. And then this creature appeared. He had wings like a bat and big muscles and five horns. And I could tell he hated me by the way he looked at me with his eight eyes. And when he spoke, there was a feeling of oppression that came over me like I'd never had before. And he said, where are your friends now? Where are your people now? Where's your money? I'll tell you, you're a nobody. You got nothing. Everything that you had, I gave to you. And now you're gonna have to pay for it with your soul. Bendicio mami, me voy para la calle. Reza por mí para que mi suerte no me falle. And I started to feel pain, hatred of myself, regretting everything I did. And I found myself on the brink of the sorrowful abyss, which gathers in the thundering of infinite woes. So Troy said that reading Dante brought back memories of things that he, places that he hadn't been in a long time. Troy has strong faith and wisdom, believing that the power of life will bring you through hell. Troy worked as a tour guide in New York for seven years, 
so came to know the place well. And interestingly, in the Inferno, Virgil is Dante's tour guide, but Dante also acts as a tour guide for the readers. So for Troy, the tour guide's guide, he has chosen his brother, Carl, who was a longtime New Yorker. And sadly, it was the tragic death of his brother, Carl, that brought Troy to the city to help care for his brother's fiance, who was with child. He ended up staying for a long time, coming to know the city. And so for this story, he has turned New York into his own version of the Inferno, designating different places to be the different levels of hell. So he has a place for the lustful, for the gluttonous, for the fraudulent. And this scene is in Port Authority, which is his limbo. Um, interestingly, he's also put his paradise, or heaven, in New York, the brightest place, the center of Times Square, where he compares the coming back of Christ to the dropping of the glittering ball on New Year's. And so um, it's, you can see how, I think even in this excerpt that we're going to do, where we're both playing Troy, you can see the paradoxes that he has present all in one place, the riches and the poverty, the light and the dark, and the cacophony of temptations and emotions, and so much noise. In New York, New York, it's a hell of a town. Bronx is up and the battery's down. People riding all on the ground. New York, it's a hell of a town. Through me, the way into eternal sorrow. Through me, the way among the lost peoples. New York, New York, big city of dreams. But everything in New York ain't always what it seems. You might get fooled if you come from out of town. But I'm down by law and I know my way around. Too much. Too, too many, many people, people too, too much. much. As I was led by my guide, I descended down the steps, each harder and harder to take, a journey taken every day by so many, and yet fear had crept into my bones. On the surface, I noticed white smoke billowing up from underground, not knowing from where it was produced. I tried to enter at 8 and 40 second, which houses Port Authority. In New York, concrete jungle where dreams are made of, there's nothing you can't do, now you're in New York. Through these doors, many enter. It is your connection to the world. Trains, planes, automobiles, buses, all start off here. This is a place that can connect you to any point on Earth. And yet all around me, I could see the remnants of poverty, despair, debauchery, ugliness, hurt, pain, loneliness. The gift of life really means a lot, and in the ghetto your life is all you got. So you take to the streets, trying to exist, in the trash, in the slime of a world like this. What you watch on TV tells you how life ought to be, but when you look around, the only thing you see is the poverty-stricken reality. Too, too much, much, too, too many, many people, too much. much. It was easy to see the despair on their faces those lying in the gutter, those provocatively dressed, and yet somehow they were familiar. Like I knew them, they could be me. Their, Their sighs, sighs weeping, weeping, loud wailing, resounded through the starless air. air. They, they cursed, cursed God, God and their parents and the human and race, race and the place and the time and the seed of their, their sowing and of their, and of their birth. birth. Sounds, the honking of horns, blaring of whistles, all in hurry. In New York, concrete jungle where dreams are made of, there's nothing you can't do, now you're in New York. Strange languages. Horrible tongues. Words of pain. Accents of anger. Voices loud and hoarse. And the sounds of blows with them made a tumult that turned forever in that air darkened without time. Like the sand when a whirlwind blows. And I said, what is this I hear? And who is this people so overcome by grief? They have no hope. Abandoned places, angry faces, much hate and hunger throughout the races. So you run in the rain trying to ease your pain. Oh, but it drives you insane. Too much. Too many people, too much. We walked for what seemed like forever, but the darkness remained the same. There was minimum light. I could not tell if it was natural light or the many signs, billboards that were on every building, from adult video stores to nail salons to dry cleaners, which was ironic because the only clothing people wore was black, no color. These streets will make you feel brand new. Big lights will inspire you. Let's hear it for New York. Tall buildings, short buildings, 
smell of death loomed in the air. It seemed to still be coming from each tunnel entrance we passed, avenue by avenue and street by street, which seems to never end. The scenery became more depressing with each step. With so many people, it's hard to find a place to be alone. And yet, it's one of the loneliest places in the world. New York, New York, big city of dreams. But everything in New York ain't always what it seems. Might get fooled if you come from out of town. But I'm down by law, and I know my way around. Too, too much, too many people, too much. The dark, dark landscape trembled so violently that in fear terror, my memory bathes me again in the sweat. The tearful earth gave forth a wind that flashed with crimson light. These streets will make you feel brand new. Big lights will inspire you. Let's hear it for New York, New York, New York. We've been humbled to work this semester with a man named Vernal, who goes by the nickname Preach. The scene you're going to see today combines his daughter's funeral, his final exit from hell, and a vision of heaven amidst the stars. Throughout his work with the Inferno, he has returned to the subject of children again and again. Losing his daughter led him to, in his words, give up on life and is at the root of the reasons he is now in prison. He worked in insurance, but always cared about what other people thought about him and wanted to get up, get caught up with those he thought were cool. When directing us to perform his words, he said, don't be afraid to say it. Don't worry if I'll be offended. I'm in prison. I'm already offended. As is one who sees in dream, and after the dream the passion impressed remains, but the rest does not return to mind, so am I. For almost all my vision has ceased, but still there trickles into my ears the sweetness born of it. I believe it rained on that day. I was feeling so bad, everybody giving me hugs, showing me love. I'm sitting in the front row, dressed in black. I'm no longer a dad. The preacher gave a beautiful eulogy, would have made Jesus weep. She got a lot of flowers and a big wreath. Now, I must say goodbye as they throw dirt on her casket. She's six feet deep. So some may say that's my dark woods. I call it my pitch black because it's more than dark. It's murky, gloomy, like soot, absence of light. We continued to the center toward which all weight collects, and I was trembling in the eternal chill. I saw a thousand faces made dog-like by the cold, naked along several blocks, holding back tears and clutching personal keepsakes. They had to go through this field that was swampy blood with the smell of human feces. You could tell they had truly given up. Just then, six men walked by me, and they all needed to pull their pants up. I saw a bunch of little kids playing in a parking lot. None of them could have been over three years old, but they all had a bad case of the runny nose. And the little girls really need their butts kicked. Only 13, 14, and already pregnant? All the noise off of steel and concrete walls made it impossible to hear. But I yelled out to my guide, what's wrong with these people? Passing through the shades that the heavy rain weighs down on that hidden path to return to the, dark, to the bright world, Moses turned and looked at me and said, it is their kids that you speak about. They're in line to leave this place, but they must go through hell first. And one who had lost both ears to the freezing, still with his face turned down, said, why do you mirror yourself in us? Then I seized him by the scalp and said, I like to walk in the rain to ease my pain, hold my head to the sky and let my eyes drink. I remember that tragic day just like it was yesterday, the death of my daughter. 
So does that mean I'm living in sorrow? My future's bleak, so forget tomorrow. I'm so tired, barely breathing, life's deceiving. They be saying God's gonna make it better, but I'm not believing. Word is, she's in a better place. No sickness, no creed, no color, no race. That's what religion be selling. But look at me, in prison, undereducated, an addict, and two-time felon. You will never have a burden too hard to handle. That's what was said. But I'll give up my life to bring Chanel back from the dead. You heard what I said. I'm hurt and I'm pissed. Sometimes I wonder, do God even exist? How could I say I'm blessed to wake up when the Bible teaches that heaven is better than this? Why so much strife in life? This can't be life. I have fallen short in my faith. Some may say it's in vain. Me? I just keep looking for cloudy days so I can walk in the rain. As me and Moses, my faithful guide, continued our long, difficult journey up out of hell, I realized he had helped me through so much. Just thinking about all my obstacles and everything I've been through in life, I finally got a friend I can really trust. I started to cry. Up we climbed, he first and I second until I saw the beautiful things the heavens carry through a round opening. And thence, we came forth again to look at the stars. As we looked up, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. I looked, and I could see heaven. Now, I'm going to tell you it started raining, but you all know that was really tears in my eyes. My addiction and crime is my story. Take heed so you don't fall victim. But my heaven is a state of mind. As I looked around, I saw my whole family. And yeah, they were still arguing and mad at one another, but we started having Thanksgiving and Christmas meals all together once again, like when Grandma was still living. I don't know about you, but that's heaven to me. Being a better father to the two kids I have now. The whole family sat down and made plans to go visit Chernell and my grandma's gravesite. It's crazy. I've been looking for something I had all the time. In the end, all our journeys have to bring us home. As is one who sees in dream, and after the dream the passion impressed remains, but the rest does not return to mine, so am I. For almost all my vision has ceased, but still there trickles into my ears the sweetness born of it. So you know, we're videotaping the performance today because it means a lot for the men to have their words heard outside of prison. Uh, so we want to bring back the video for them so that they can see how their words were performed on Monday. We'll have a performance in the prison where the men themselves will perform their own words together with, um, with, the, with the students. Uh, but today, of course, they couldn't come, so we're going to show them what happened. And they also would love to hear your responses to their words. Uh, and that will be part of the video that we bring back to them as well. So 
so please let us know uh, what, what, uh, what your responses are. And, uh, but before uh, we give you a chance to, to, re to respond and ask questions to the cast, um, I wanted to introduce uh, Marie, Maria Pirot, who is the uh, principal of the school at McDougall Walker uh, Correctional Institution. She's the one really responsible for letting us uh, come in and, uh, and, and, and bring this class. Uh, and we worked together for, for years past as well when Maria Perot was in another institution. That's where she met Alma, when Alma was one of my students at Wesleyan working in the, uh, uh, at, at the Gates Correctional Institution. And that's where uh, the Dante Project generated the song that Alma sang at the beginning, which was really like a prayer, uh, a prayer to God to understand the things that nobody on earth could understand. Um, so maybe we could uh, begin uh, by, do, you, do, do you, either of you have a microphone? No. Oh, here, okay. So maybe we could begin uh, with uh, Maria Perot talking a little bit about the, the, uh, what the project was like from your perspective, because you knew the men before we did, and uh, that, that, that would be a great place to begin. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Um, it's, it's definitely an honor to be here. It's an honor to work with um, Dr. Jenkins and all the students that he brings in. And it's also an honor um, for me to work with the students at the McDougall Walker Correctional Institution. Um, I'm, I'm inspired by this project, which is why I think um, Dr. Jenkins and I continue to work together no matter which facility I'm at, uh, because I see the amazing growth, I see the transformation, I see the commitment from the students that I work with, and it continues to inspire me to bring programs like that to the school um, because of the social growth, the moral growth, the emotional growth that the students undergo. Um, the academic piece is certainly very important. The vocational piece is, of course, very important. Um, but I believe in looking at the entire person and trying to nurture the entire person. And that means bringing programs that nurture the soul. And that's what I see when um, the students participate in the program, and especially at the end when they perform in front of their peers, which is no easy feat in a correctional facility. But they perform their heart, their soul, their words um, in front of their peers and in front of the rest of the staff. Uh, school staff and custody staff, and, I, and I'm always very moved when I see their performances. Thank you. And, uh, um, Al Alma, could you talk a little bit about uh, uh, watching this performance and the memories that it brings up of the work that you did when you were, when, uh, when you were working with Dante in, a, in another setting? Yeah, I'm always, I've seen a few different um, classes work at this point and it, it's always incredible how how different each performance is depending on the you know just who the men are who are writing these reflections um, and I also toured with Professor Jenkins and three three women who did this program um, at York uh, Correctional Institution and um, I'm sad that Sandra couldn't be here today. Um, these, were, these were three women who were incarcerated when they began to work with us, with uh, Dante and Shakespeare mm -hmm. in prison. And when they were released, they went on a tour with us, uh, performing a piece mm -hmm. about their experiences. And Alma was one of the cast members in that tour. And we, were, we invited Sandra to come, but she couldn't come today. And I, so that, that was sort of the you know, greatest hits of um, this, this program. And to... It's the format that the inmates, people who are in prison, um, choose. It can vary enormously from from group to group. So this this format it was different than um, anyone that I'd seen before. Also, just focusing on the individual men and them each sharing their their stories. We sort of had worked in small groups and had like a chronological through the book sort of approach. We took different um, people's reflections uh, from different parts of the um, long work that we did with them and sort of strung them together into a, a piece that went through the arc of the story um, of the Inferno. And I've, I've also seen 
versions of the reflections that have been um, much more like a, a narrative play that everyone works on together. And so I just love how, how each group does something really different with this text. And it's very much just open to, to people to work with it however it makes most sense to them. So that's always been very moving. Um, do do any, of you, any of you in the audience have any questions or comments that, uh, that, that you'd like to, to make or ask? Yes. Well, we don't know yet what it's like to perform in the prison because that happens on Monday. But we do know what it's like to, to, to work with this text in, in the prison. So maybe some of you could respond to that question. That, thanks for your question. That's a great question. And uh, I mean, t one answer is, is working with just the, the unpredictability of the schedule. Um, you know, that Professor Jenkins men mentioned at the outset of the performance that, you know, there were times when it snowed and that meant um, that we weren't able to visit. Um, and that uh, delayed the beginning and sometimes interrupted our times working. Um, but with, you know, through that, you also have the guys inside who are um, so dedicated to their work that they keep on working through those interruptions. And so when we then come back, it's like, it's like, what has started when we were there the last time has just blossomed into something else. Um, and so it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting process. Yeah, and I think Ms. Perot deserves credit here too because uh, she was kind of our, our angel uh, when she was able to be there with us. All of the kind of bureaucratic gates sort of went down. <laughs> uh, just like in, in the Inferno, you know, Dante and Virgil are arrested at several points on their way through hell because you know, someone says, oh, you're not supposed to be here, get out, and then uh, an angel has to come from heaven and say, no, they have to go on this journey. <laughs> so we kind, of, we kind of had our own angel for that, and the, the, the complications got less, got less complex. Uh. I think um, I, I felt a degree of um, responsibility um, because we're going into their space and they put an enormous amount of trust in us by sharing very personal stories with people they had only just met basically and then we got to leave and take the stories away with us and then take them to people on the outside and so yeah um, there was a huge um, amount of trust that they gave to us which was which is a big responsibility and so I think uh, a large part of trying to communicate some of our experiences has been knowing that there's always going to be a disconnect between what they're going through and, and what it's like for people who can go in and then leave. Um, so. And I would just add in terms of, you know, there's a really deep responsibility in terms of making sure that the things they've written and performed with us in rehearsals there, that we get, that those are shared with the world. That's a huge responsibility on us. But it's also, you know, the transition then to performing it yourself is really disquieting because it's, it's very uncomfortable and you know, you, you want to, we're just a shadow of them in terms of our ability to perform this text. And that's a, that's a really hard thing to wrestle with. In the last week, I mean, a majority of our conversation with them at our final rehearsal was just getting their approval. And them saying, no, do it. And we were like, yeah, I know, but like, I'm really uncomfortable. Like, do you really want me to do this? And, and they're like, yeah, own it. And, you know, don't fix my English and don't do the, you know, just put it out there for me. And, um, so, I mean, and that was, and it's really moving to get their approval to do that, which only makes the responsibility that much greater. That's basically what I was going to share as well, is that our last rehearsal, their, um, their practice and their performance was so powerful. Like, even though we'd heard it a lot of times, you know, laughing hysterically and practically crying. So it was really scary at that point to be like, there is no way that we can communicate this so we talked a lot about like what does it mean to try to bring the spirit of what they've tried to put into this and bring it here knowing that we can't do it the same way that they did but um, still in our own way through the relationships that we built can we try to somehow bring at least what they were the spirit of what they were communicating mm -hmm. 
Also, as different as the environment here and at the prison are, I think for, for them, the environment is also quite different between the classroom and their day-to-day day -day life. Um, and this is really the highlight, one of the highlights of their week, I think. And we get in there and we have a limited amount of time with them and they cherish it. And they told us, as Kevin said, when we had uh, to cancel for snow um, and other things, they were even more disappointed than we were um, not to be able to go there. So I think this is really um, huge for them. And one of the extremely important things to the individual I was working with was that his family and friends were going to be able to see this, and it was a way of communicating out from where he is. Can, uh, can, can I break in there and g give uh, people in the audience who are the family and friends of the, of the men who wrote these pieces a chance to, uh, to, to make their comments or ask, uh, ask any questions, uh, if, if you would like to. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's up to you. Um, could, yeah, could you give them the uh, microphone? Okay. Um, I have a question. So I know that you spend a lot of time with the inmates. Is there anything that you were able to take away from spending so much time and getting to know, to know them? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, aside from it being like a very deeply humbling experience, just um, feeling a sense of responsibility with them that they were they were coming to us in a way with a lot more than we were bringing to them. Um, I think that there's there's a difference there, but there's also like, the way that we felt very close to them very quickly. Uh, I think within the third visit, uh, I remember looking out and just everybody was laughing and they were they were engaged in in what they were doing. And I think we just entered a space where they could really be themselves. And that was something that Jay told us when Hannah and I were working with him. That was just so moving for both of us um, that. Uh, out in the rest of the prison they have these personas that they have to be and this was a place where they could really nourish who they were um, and we've, we found that courage and that vulnerability really impressive. I think to, um, to echo uh, what Juana said about vulnerability um, one of the really thing, one of the really interesting things for me uh, this semester has been getting to know the guys that we work with, and also realizing that um, a lot of the things that led them to make the decisions that they did are things that we all wrestle with, um, in terms of wanting to be accepted, wanting to fit in, needing social approval, um, and you know we all embody these needs and desires in different ways, but um, really getting to know people and say like. I think it was what uh, was it in Troy's piece where he said, and I looked at all these people and I thought, they could be me. And so seeing the human resonance, um, you know, you hear about prisons, you hear about people who are in prisons, you know, everyone who's there is dangerous. And, you know, I have like friends in my um, back home or my family are like, oh my God, I can't believe you're going into a prison. And it's so the reality of the people that I've met there and spent time with um, is, it, again, I mean, it's, it's, these people could be me. And so finding the commonalities that we share, also learning new things from one another, um, because we all have different lived experiences. It's been just a huge, I feel, it's been such a huge blessing uh, for me, and I think for a lot of other people in the class as well, to have had this privilege to, to go to the prison and, and see, see these guys for who they really are. The, the overriding theme, I think, um, of a lot of conversations that we had with them was how much they want to be at home. Um, the theme that they would come back to over and over again was their family, their loved ones, the people that they feel they've let down, the people that they want to make amends with. Um, and I think that was one of the things that was, that was most moving um, for me, that everyone knows what it's like to different degrees to lose somebody or to have someone go away for a long time. Um, but their permanence with that distance and the struggle that they go through knowing that they're not with the people that they love um, and their willingness to acknowledge that and their own failures in that regard and their wish to make that better, I think was something that was a really like, common theme amongst all the groups.
I think one of the things that I, I was just so struck with was um, kind of on the topic of home, but in a different way, uh, temporary homes. I mean, was the hospitality that, that they showed to us in being in sort of this space that they have more familiarity with at this point than, than we would, of course. And being in that classroom with them, I mean, you know, I was working with uh, a brother, Lenny, who, who was with us for several weeks and then was transferred to another institution. And he'd done so much writing in the first couple of weeks that we were still able to work with that material and perform it um, by his request. And, um, but during the rest of our sessions, of course, he wasn't there. So uh, Julian and I were bouncing around these different groups who had already begun to form sort of working relationships with the other members of our class. Um, and the, the just generosity of spirit and time that the guys showed in sort of the collaborative relationships that we formed with them. Um, you know, working with Jakari on the piece that, uh, that I worked a little bit with him on and working with Jay on the piece that, he, that I worked a little bit with him on um, after Lenny had left, they were just so beautifully generous. I mean, that was something that really was moving to me. Yeah, I was working uh, closely with Jakari in a, in a small group and one thing that really inspired me is his kind of deep, deep love for his kids and the way he really identifies heaven with them, with getting a chance to, to be a dad to them. And uh, we saw in kind of his inscription to heaven in the performance that this is a place where, where all fathers are daddies. He, he was, you know, also showed us while we were, while we were meeting with him uh, a children's book he'd, he'd worked on for them. And I just uh, am kind of really touched and moved by that. Okay. And are there, are there other uh, comments from people who know the writers or who don't know the writers that you would like uh, us to bring back to the men in terms of your response to what they said? I think he was just very happy that he was able to work with you guys and be able to tell his story. Other comments or questions? Um, I guess, I, I guess uh, um, could, could you, uh, Ms. Burrow, talk a little bit about um, uh, you know, maybe this individual group compared to other groups that you've, uh, that you've seen? I'd be happy to. Um, I always get excited with programs like, the, like these um, because it's an opportunity to influence public perspective about humanity because each one of us in this room will leave with something today from these words. And when I have the students standing in front of me, it's just another human being sitting in front of me. And I try to treat that person like I would treat my own son, and that's with kindness and understanding. And I think that this group of gentlemen, I know each one of them, um, some of them were very persistent in wanting to participate in this program um, because they recognize the value that it would bring. And I try to, we do several programs. We have creative writing programs. We have a mindfulness and meditation program. So I wanted to try to reach out to folks who didn't have an opportunity to participate in some of the other programs. Um, and when these gentlemen found out that they were able to participate, they were just very excited um, because each person who had expressed interest uh, participated in a sort of preliminary talk with Dr. Jenkins to understand what the program entailed. And from there, I got pestered almost every day. <laughs> um, and, but that's exactly what I want. I want, um, I want the students to be excited and inspired and driven to do something because the conversations that I have with these gentlemen are conversations about their growth and their desire to be better than they were the day before. And so they inspire me and I will learn from them and I learn from anybody that is put before me so that I can be a better person and help the population that I serve be better people every day as well. But I will say that I was very impressed with the performances. You guys were amazing. I don't know if you do this professionally or, but it was, it was amazing. And watching the gentlemen perform even just their practice run, um, they're, they're passionate. They're getting, they're getting um, a message across. They're getting feelings in a safe place, and that's what we want the school to be, is a safe place, and that's why the programs uh, are so popular, because within those walls, within those two hours or so, it's a very safe place to be expressive in a room of people that aren't judging. 
So I, I noticed how much the gentlemen did grow, the smiles on their faces, um, even when they're not engaged in the program, the next couple of days, it, it stays with them. And that's what we hope, that, that this kind of feeling is generalized into the units, into their lives, and just they embody it. They embody that feeling of, I'm important. I have something to say and people are listening. Is this for a specific class? Like how are these um, men chosen to be a part of this wonderful play? When we have an idea about a program, I start talking to the guys about it, start getting their feedback. I like to ask them what kind of programs they're interested in. And when we settle on a program, I put something out to the, to the population, to the school students, um, because McDougal Walker is a very big facility and we only have limited spaces. Um, so we put the information out to the school students and we just get an idea about who's interested from there. We usually have just an introduction to the course where Dr. Jenkins talks about the expectations, the duration of the program, and some gentlemen elect not to participate. It's not for them because a program like this, as you can see, you have to get real. If you really want to grow through the program, if you really want to make it meaningful, and you can't really fake that. So some gentlemen aren't ready for that, and that's okay. Maybe they'll participate in another volunteer program that we have, because this is all volunteer for the, for the guys. Um, from there, we narrow down our list. We try to give opportunity to those gentlemen who haven't had a chance to participate in any of our, our other volunteer programs. And then we enroll them, and the expectation is very clear. Um, mandatory attendance, unless you know, there's a, a really good reason for it. Um, but from there, you don't really have to force the guys to be there. They really want to be there. Um, so it's, it's voluntary and then we just really try to get everyone as involved as possible so that each person has an opportunity. Um, yeah, it's, we, we, we um, were working with Jay, who was actually a DJ before he was incarcerated. And so, actually, the topic of music was a really painful one for him. And part of the course was that, because it brought back a lot of memories of his time before he was in prison, and part of the course was that they had to choose songs on quite a regular basis to go with the scenes they were writing. Um, and so... Um, for Jay, there's actually in your programs um, a story with his piece about one of his experiences um, in choosing a song. Um, and why do you want to talk a little bit about that? And yeah. Um, so uh, Jay, uh, Jay <laughs> has a cellmate who he feels a sort of mutual distance with, and uh, he. He had to, he was looking for a song and because he was a DJ and music is so important to him, he really felt he couldn't just use any song. He had to, it had to hit him, it had to be the right song. And he just, that occasion was an opportunity for him to reach out to his cellmate and he, and we love the way he told us the story. He said, I just put my hand out and I said, bless me with a song <laughs> or bless me with a CD. And his, uh, <laughs> And his, his cellmate put a CD in his hand and he listened to the first few tracks and they didn't, you know, but he, he, they didn't work, but he kind of kept listening. And then he was so excited to tell us that that was how he had found his song. And um, it was a song by Jerry, Mary J. Blige that we were th saying the four lines from. But uh, yeah, I think, uh, and then when we were looking for, uh, we wanted him to hear the radio, the Radiohead song. <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was funny. So, <laughs> um, we, we, I, when we were sort of editing his writings, um, the song Wolf at the Door by Radiohead kind of struck me as, as a song that might work quite well with the, the wolf piece. Um, and so, there's, I mean, there's a lot of trust they have to put in us as well because we kind of go back to them with their work and we're like, hey, what do you think about this? And they sort of have to like either say I hate it or like, yeah, okay, let's try it. And, and so he hadn't heard Wolf at the Door and could just see the lyrics written down and he sort of went, well, I'll see if I can find if any of my Caucasian friends have this. <laughs> <laughs> and so he said he asked around and like some of them heard of Radiohead but no one had the song. <laughs> and so 
He's only actually heard it on the piano, um, which <laughs> Julian played. Um, but yeah, so they, they don't actually have access to any music they don't already have. And so they have a sort of limited CD collection that they're working with. But yeah, does anyone else? Yeah, I was also just going to say, I think music was a huge um, part of them all coming out of their shells quite a lot. Um, at the beginning, when the uh, emphasis was put on music and they didn't realize that when they signed up for the class, I don't think, a lot of them seemed a little frightened and um, didn't feel like they wanted to sing. And um... oh. Well, the, f the first thing we did when we met them was present um, a song, each of us, to accompany a couple of lines from Dante's Inferno uh, as a way of breaking the ice and showing them, you know, a little bit of the, the a taste of the work that we'd be doing with them. And, um, you know, most of them were not uh, feeling excited about singing. Uh, and then when they realized that they could sort of shovel that up over to us, a lot of them felt better about it, um, and, and that enjoyed the process of coming up with songs that they really loved. Uh, a lot of them like rap music, a lot of them like rock music, and putting those words in their own writing meant a lot, I think, because they felt like they were on the same plane as the lyricists and um, able to just have a more um, full, rich, sonic uh, atmosphere for the, the words that they were writing. I think, um, so the group that I worked with uh, was this Spanish-speaking group, and both of the guys speak a fair amount of English. Um, one of them is pretty much fluent, and the other one, you know, we had to dialogue back and forth and need to try to figure out what the other person was saying. Um, but in terms of music, and, and working with that, uh, with, those, with those guys, um, that was what really made uh, their piece come alive, I think, for them, and to be able to pull music in um, from, you know, from their own country. Uh, one guy that I worked with is Dominican, and so picking up the bachata music was really important for him. Um, and then uh, being able to infuse that into the pieces that they were working with gave them, uh, it, re it really, it brought their personality to it in a different way, and I think that it really opened them up to the broader group that they could bring their whole selves. And uh, so that was, M music uh, in my group function in that way as uh, a way to sort of cross some cultural barriers and uh, I got introduced to a lot of great music during the process. Um, Alma, could you talk a little bit about the way that you generated that song? Because that song was actually written by the absolutely, man that you Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think in general, because I was also working with the Spanish-speaking group um, and there were about five, five people. We had much larger groups of folks than um, than this class did, uh, and I think for for particularly for Carlos, who wrote that song, he did not speak any English really, and I th it was one of the first times he said where his knowledge of Spanish was sort of considered and treated as a skill in this country, mm -hmm. um, and that that was really moving for him to to be able to feel like oh, I have this specialty and I have this talent and this skill in this language that for as long as I've lived in this country has always just felt like something that's holding me back. Um, and he had written a lot of songs. He was always writing in, in the context of the church mostly. Um, and, and there were a Correct me if I'm wrong, but there, there were a few participants in that class who um, had some access to instruments. Um, Through religious services, there usually are instruments and they have a band and so yeah. So, so the collaboration between the, the religious services and, um, and the people in the class, that was really wonderful to be able to um, yeah, let that happen. Um, and I think that for, for, for Carlos in particular, he had an amazing piece about, um, actually, um, the piece that Yvonne wrote really reminded me of his piece, but, but about crossing the border. Um, and I think for him, for him the, the music was, this is, this is like, five years ago now, so it's, it was a while ago. But um, for, for him, the music was 
a, a way to sort of access um, the pain of his experience without having to relive it as much as in, in some of the writing that he was doing. So it felt safer um, and it felt like you can still get all the emotion across without, without um, really, you know, bearing your entire soul and the whole story, everything you've been through. Um, so I think that, that that was really important for, um, for them. Yeah. When, uh, after the first uh, session, I was walking around the entire school and I popped into a couple classes. And there are a few students that were in common classes. So I said, tell me how to go, how to go. <sighs> Miss Pirro, there was a lot of singing. <laughs> and I said, and? They just looked at me blankly. They weren't sure what to do. I don't know if it, what kind of singing it was, but then um, they started to embrace the music and really embrace what it represented. So it was, it's also a shift for them to, to hear different types of music and to be in contact with um, the, the diversity of the music. So I think they grow in that sense too. I think music piece is very powerful. So I think we, we, we should wrap up soon if we have time for maybe one more comment. Uh, yeah, uh, or maybe two comments there. Okay, yes. You for, uh, uh, first, sir. I, I have a question for the, the students. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what the process was, the writing process was like, the negotiating when there might have been conflict between what some of you were working with wanted to write and what you thought would be impactful for the other way around? Uh, and, just, and the other question, so we'll have them both at the same time, or comment? My comment is I want to thank you for sharing your journey, and I hope that you will thank them for sharing their journey. And I'm just curious how the performance works with them and you. I mean, you did the whole performance. How does it work? How will it work on Monday? Okay, so maybe you can respond to both of those. those. So uh, um, the first question, uh, and I'm, I'm sure it was different for everybody in terms of how they negotiated what they were going to add or take out or... Um, how they were going to put the piece together with Dante. Um, I mean, really, from the very beginning, we told the guys uh, that this is your piece. Don't be afraid to tell us you don't like something. Um, and it was really kind of an organic process. There was really, you know, there was never, there was never really any conflict. I mean, we, there was a couple of times where I brought a song and Yvonne was like, no, this is lame. Um, <laughs> but, but in terms of, you know, and that was just kind of funny, and so we found a song that he liked instead. So it really... They were really excited to see, I mean, I don't know if that was everybody else's experience, they were excited to see what we, what we brought to it. Um, and, and we kind of fed off of each other. Um, yeah, so we, we really, uh, so Jay's way of putting it, you know, he said, I'm not, I'm not a big writer, I'm a better talker than a writer. Um, and we sort of said, well, you do the talking and we'll write it down. And that's what, what we, did really, but actually it, that didn't come to be true because everything that we just performed by Jay was his words. Um, we did a very small amount of editing and a couple of places we slightly changed one or two words to make the rhyme scheme fit the whole way through, but he came up with the rhyme scheme, he wrote the words, you know, he chose the song. Um, so it was really, they would give us material, we'd go home and edit it and write it up in a way we could show it to them like, here's, here's what it looked like as a script. And then the, we would go through it together and yeah. Um, and to the second question, it's different for different groups, but in our group, Jay will be performing the whole thing and we're just doing the singing. So he'll be performing it as a monologue. And for most groups, it is the case that they're sort of just taking the main roles and we're supporting them. You had another question, is that what you said? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Oh, that, uh, just to address the second question about how things will work on Monday. And, and also the first, the first comment you made about thanking them. Absolutely, and we have almost every single week. Um, every single week begins with, and it's, it's amazing just how, just how much these guys reach out. Every single week when they enter the room, because we go into small groups and work on the individual scenes and then come together in a larger group towards the end, but every time we start class, every single man comes and shakes every single one of our hands, and we have an exchange, um, you know, good day, how are you, go how are you doing in that first five minutes, and, and every class ends with us basically thanking them. And this last, our basically dress rehearsal last Monday was very difficult for us in the last half hour. Um, but in terms of how the performance is working on Monday, I mean, you know, that's, that's why I said earlier, it's, here it's really difficult because we're just a shadow. 
and um, on Monday it's going to be basically them. And there's been a really interesting reciprocal relationship of us editing and directing them um, in our class sessions there, but them directing us in terms of what to do here today. And um, on Monday, there's a few little background supporting things, like they're singing or someone else is playing a minor role in somebody's piece. But I mean, these guys were fully off book within a week, and you know, they're completely committed to this work. And it's going to be Monday morning. Um, that's the time when the majority of their colleagues can witness their work. So. I think that's important, uh, what Aaron said, that sometimes they direct us, sometimes we direct them. You know, in Dante's story, there's the Virgil who's the guide, and uh, sometimes we are their guides, and sometimes they are our guides. Sometimes they're Virgil for us, sometimes we're Virgil for them. It was very reciprocal collaboration. But what was your question, you said? Um, when you were acting out all of the plays, I noticed you guys did a really good job about portraying their pain and their happiness and stuff. Was it hard for you to be able to really pull what's out of them and what they feel and be able to show it? Like, did you have to reach inside to like a dark place or a really happy place to be able to show what they're really feeling? Well, um, you know, I, I experienced, and you guys tell me if you saw this too, um, I noticed a difference between the younger guys and the older guys in the class. I worked with two of the younger guys, and initially there was a lot more like, you know, this needing to sort of like posture and like be cool and, um, but after we got into, and the older guys were just, especially the guys that are, you know, sort of function there, I think there's two of them that are mentors for people that are coming in, and they were like real all the way, you know, they, they, brought, they brought the pain and the sadness and the difficulties with that immediately. Um, and for some of the younger guys, you know, there was still that need to like, be the man, like be cool. Um, and really yesterday for the first time, I, uh, I had to go up to the, um, to the, to the prison, thank you to Ms. Perot for giving me an extra visit. The guy, uh, there's one other person that's in our class actually, um, who's sick and uh, so he wasn't able to perform today. So we were doing some reworking last minute yesterday. And um, really I think yesterday was the first time and it was when no other guys were around. It was just me and the two people in my group. There was no need to, you know, like put on, the, put, put that guard up, even, even in the context of the classroom, which is relatively safe, right? Um, and they just, blossomed. I mean, it was just amazing to watch both of them. And all of a sudden, there were like all these feelings and emotions. And Yvonne told me that um, the, the story that you guys heard um, about his mom and his coming here, he hasn't told anybody in the prison about that. And he's been there for two years. And nobody, nobody oh. he spends time with knows that story about him. And so I think it's coming out little by little. And while you may not get this initial gush of feeling, um, it's, uh, it takes a little bit of working, but it's there, and it needs to be shared, and they want to share it. But I think it depends on the person, the age, their location, if, if that makes sense. Um, I, are we allowed to film that on Monday? <laughs> Here's where the sort of correctional side of things comes in. Um, it, it may be filmed, but I don't know that it would be for public, for public view, just because of the safety security component of of the facility, um, but we were trying, sorry? I will have to look into that. I'm, I will have to look into that. I'm actually really gl glad you brought up the family piece because this whole time I'm thinking, I, I, for the family members who are here, thank you so much. It's so amazing and special and important to have you here. And um, I know that the guys are going to be just really excited that you came out and showed support. Um, the family is the biggest link of my 15 years in the department. Um, the family plays the most important role in um, the experience of, of our guys and gals who are incarcerated. So thank you so much for being here and for showing support to the people you love. I think we can uh, end on that great note, and I encourage the members of the family uh, to stay longer and talk with us individually uh, about, about the work that we've been doing with your friends and family, and, uh, because we're happy to stay longer and talk to you. And I'll just end uh, with, the, with, the, with, with the words of Dante that always uh, stay with me, uh, because I, I learn so much when I go to, to, uh, to work in the prisons. You know, you asked what we learned. I could go on for hours about what I learned. Every time I'm there, 
I find, I find something out about Dante's text that I would never have understood in any other context. And, you know, and one of the, 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 the lines that always comes back is when he, he says, uh, gente di molto valore uh, erano sospeso in quel limbo. Uh, me, people of great value are suspended in that limbo. And uh, we really learn that that's true. So thank you all for, for being here today.